Uh, good morning, uh, people in Jakarta and surround. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Sarah Davis. Uh, thank you for joining uh, us uh, and willing to give a lecture uh, on uh, containing contagion, the politics of disease outbreak in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're uh, really privileged and honored to have you here. Uh, but before we enter uh, the presentation from Professor Sarah Davis, I would like to call uh, Head of International Relations Department of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Indonesia, Dr. Safia Muhibat, to uh, give an opening remark and explain a little bit about our uh, lecture series. Um, Dr. Safia Muhibat, uh, time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fitri. Um, good morning to those of you in Jakarta and um, good afternoon to those of you in Australia. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, in this edition of uh, CSIS lecture series uh, on regional dynamics. Um, the lecture series has been a program of ours um, for the past two years. Um, so we usually hold um, lectures from uh, by prominent speakers um, at least once a month uh, in our building in CSIS. But uh, we've been um, um, vacuumed for the past um, three months or so um, due to current situation. So this is a restart um, of, um, of our program. Um, we are privileged to have Professor Sarah Davis um, to join us today in this, in this lecture. Um, so hopefully this new format, um, with this new format, we, we are still able to discuss um, the important issues um, that is preoccupying or um, is of concern um, to our region. So again, thank you all of uh, those of you who are our regular um, attendees in our um, regular lecture series and those of you just joining us today. Um, I hope you will join us again in our um, future um, lecture series um, events as well. So um, again, thank you and, and welcome. Uh, back to you, Fitri. Thank you, Mavizi. Thank you, Dr. Safia Muhibat, Head of uh, International Relations Department of CSIS Indonesia. Um, ladies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are joined today uh, by Professor Sarah Davis. Uh, She's a professor at the School of Government and International Relations, Griffith University, Australia, and adjunct associate professor at the Gender, Peace, and Security Center, School of Social Science, Monash University. Um, Sarah is an international relations scholar with a specific focus on global health governance and the women, peace, and security agenda. Uh, in fact, uh, just a couple of, uh, days ago, last week, uh, Sarah, Dr. Sarah and her team uh, has, uh, has um, published uh, their survey res result on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on women, peace and security agenda in Indo-Pacific region. Um, uh, Dr. Sarah has been uh, a distinguished scholar. Uh, she uh, received Australian Research uh, Council Discovery, uh, Australian Postgraduate Award Scholar, and Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Um, today, uh, we will have the pleasure and honor uh, to discuss uh, Professor uh, Sarah Davis' book, uh, Containing Contagions, The Politic of Disease Outbreak in Southeast Asia. Uh, as we all know, before the outbreak of COVID-19, the region of Southeast Asia had already experienced a wave of emerging and endemic infectious disease outbreak ranging from Nipah, uh, SARS, avian flu to dengue. And for over a decade, uh, Southeast Asian state have shown that commitment to pursue a collective approach to the surveillance and communication of the outbreak. So what can, be what can we learn from this uh, previous experience uh, to assist with the COVID-19 response? Uh, today, uh, Professor Davis will explore how um, the region interpret their obligation to the revised international health regulation um, with a certain angle uh, aligning to the political interests and for regional cooperation. Um, 
Additionally, Professor Davis will uh, discuss the risk and benefit for continued regional investment in a cooperative health diplomacy relationship in the COVID-19 era. So, Professor Sarah Davis, I give the, um, the time to you and uh, yes, time is yours. And if you can, if you want to share your presentation, uh, please do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vichu, for that kind introduction. And thank you to CSIS Indonesia for the invitation to speak today. And thank you to Dr. Spire for the invitation as well and for, your, for inviting me to be one of the first speakers on your online um, presentation seminar. So I'm really delighted to be with you all today. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am sitting here today, which is the land of the Turrbal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, I'm going to share my screen uh, with you, and I hope that there's no glitches and it all works as it should, according to the magic of Zoom. I see Fitri nodding, so it's it should be, it's there, great thumbs up. Thank you very much. So what I wanted to talk to you today is about uh, the, the book that I published uh, before the outbreak of COVID-19. Um, they say that uh, in show business, you should never work with children or animals. I feel at the moment in academia, you should never work in the area of and I think that is an emerging uh, disaster or natural emergencies because it, uh, there's a certain amount of unpredictability and uh, pandemics is, is one of those. So I'm conscious that um, my book is absent of any discussion of COVID. So today what I'm going to try and do is explain to you why I wrote this book and what I was trying to do in this book. And then what I think, uh, what I hope is relevant uh, in terms of the findings for thinking about the COVID-19 uh, response. So the book was inspired from a book that I'd written previously with uh, some research collaborators, Adam Cameron Scott and Simon Rushton. I was actually doing the research for this book at the same time that I was writing uh, Disease Diplomacy with Adam and Simon. But uh, I'm not a quick writer. And so these books are taking a few years to do. And as I was writing disease diplomacy, I was doing the research for containing contagion, but I still wasn't quite sure what was going to be the focus uh, in, in containing contagion. And in the book, Disease Diplomacy, one of the things that we were really interested in is when, when and why do states choose to cooperate around infectious disease response? Uh, why do they, why was there this presumption uh, particularly at the point of SARS, that cooperation is what we will see rather than this, you know, states just go it alone and figure out how to do it and manage it independently. And so we trace the normative idea of, um, of health security and the creation or the redesign of the international health regulations, which were, uh, which is a legal instrument that has been, that was developed when the World Health Organization came into power in, in 1948, the IHR were adopted in 1951. They'd gone through a number of different kind of iterations, but by the 1990s, there was this sense that they were a little bit out of date. States weren't always complying with them. Uh, they were specific to diseases rather than being an instrument that you could use to apply to any type of, of emerging outbreak. Um, and so there was this sense that um, they were very good for prescripting what you should do at port of entry if there's yellow fever or if there's cholera, but they're not very good with being able to respond to the types of novel outbreak emergencies that were occurring, such as the Ebola outbreak. There was even discussions about whether or not they'd be useful in relation to a radioactive or chemical outbreak to which they weren't, they weren't applicable. And they were not also able to respond or give advice on outbreaks that were novel. So ones that states were detecting but didn't know what they were. And there wasn't a procedure in place for how to share these types of outbreak events and get advice on what to do around them. So there was a sense that the international health regulations need revision, but there'd been a sluggish kind of response to that. Lots of discussions, lots of meetings. And nothing really had, had taken place since the World Health Assembly had agreed to this in 1995. And then you have the emergence of SARS 
in 2002, 2003. And, you know, I think a lot of you now are familiar with the story of what happened there, but you have, you know, this sense of uh, someone needs to coordinate the information that's coming out about the disease, this novel disease coronavirus, that someone needs to be advising states on how they're going to map the virus, how they're going to do the sequencing of the virus, and then what needs to be done in terms of travel and trade and coordinated response to this outbreak. And the World Health Organization, led by Grohan and Brundtland, stepped into that role. And it was quite important that they did so. And there's been a lot of discussion since about how she did this, because it wasn't necessarily at the time clearly within the boundaries of what uh, the World Health Organization could do as the IHR stood. And so there was a lot of then state support for the World Health Organization to get the IHR, the International Health Regulations revised, so that next time there would be a very clear indication of what the World Health Organization could do to support states in a situation like SARS if it happened again. And also that there'd be a series of clear expectations around what a state has to do when they detect a novel outbreak, how they should report it, and then how states in response to that outbreak should also proceed. So what information should be shared, whether or not the World Health Organization would be able to declare that the outbreak may be a public health emergency of international concern, and then what that means then in terms of how states need to comply with the set of recommendations that the World Health Organization may issue. And so we've seen this performance now happen a number of times. And the coronavirus outbreak, COVID-19, is the most recent example of this, when the World Health Organization declared it a FIAC in the 30th of January in 2020. Um, but in our book, we were very interested in understanding why this was the path that states took. We did not believe that it was inevitable. There were actually other options on the table. Uh, there could have been a much weakened IHR. It could have been quite specific on diseases. It could have maybe not yielded as much authority to the World Health as Organization Director General to convene these committees that decide each time whether or not they're going to declare an outbreak as a FIAC. And there also was a lot of dispute at the time about the role of the World Health Organization and being able to provide advice uh, to states about outbreaks, being able to issue recommendations, being able to ask for states to send them information within a certain period of time, so within the 24 and 48 hour windows. And there was also a lot of discussions about the capacities so the international health regulations, when they were revised, attached capacities that states have to meet to be seen as IHR compliant. And these capacities range from legislation to creating a national focal point who would be on call 24 hours, seven days a week, uh, to the creation of risk communication guidelines, and then also being able to demonstrate that you've got laboratory and port of entry mechanisms in place to respond to an outbreak. We were interested in how that process developed and we argue that there were some very important attachments of health security to emphasising states' responsibility, that as states they have a responsibility to meet these types of conditions. But what we were found through the book was that cooperation was not confined to the World Health Organization institution and for me what was particularly interesting was the emergence perhaps because of the location of where these outbreaks were occurring, SARS in 2003, and then while the IHR was drafted and then adopted the um, spread of H5N1 amongst mostly uh, poultry, but there were some poultry to human transmissions and fear of human to human transmission across the Southeast Asian region in 2004, five up to six, seven, eight. And I was observing when we were writing the book that the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, plus the three states, South Korea, Japan, and China, were meeting a lot, talking a lot, and engaging a lot about the implementation of the international health regulations and what that would mean for them at an individual level, but also at as a regional level. There was a lot of discussions about compliance. And for me, that was notable for the strength of the discussions, for the regularity of the discussions, and for the expectations that were emerging around 
how this region needed to be ready and needed to be ready to respond irrespective of capacity. And that for me was quite interesting at the time. So there was a lot of discussions about the fact that yes, states had different health systems. Yes, states have different political regimes and they have different systems of governance from federal to centralization. But these can't be used as impediments or as excuses to not try and meet the IHR. And these are the types of discussions that I was documenting at the time when I was doing my research for the other book. And I thought it really interesting to hear that kind of sense of urgency and that sense of obligation that was being discussed in the region. One of the things that I noted then at the time was that the region had very high submission rates. So the international health regulations were asking states to do a monitoring questionnaire from 2010, uh, they didn't have to meet their eight uh, capacities, which are listed in figure two there, until 2012. But you had, amongst the ASEAN states, a uh, majority of them are members of the Western Pacific region, which is a regional office of the World Health Organization, and then the remainder are within the Southeast Asia. So three are with Cerro and seven are in Wipro. And what you saw there was that these two regional offices were really sort of hitting high marks in terms of those self-report evaluations of how they were trying to meet the IHR core capacities. And I was really interested in the fact that, the, that it was being noted by others as well. It wasn't just me observing this, that the World Health Organization, observers within the public health field, and even to some extent within the international relations field, were observing this sense of urgency and this sense of compliance. In my field of literature, what I was noticing were three explanations that were starting to come out. The first one is that uh, what we're dealing here is with um, a diplomatic engagement in peacetime. That this is not the same as compliance in war. So what we're seeing is that Capacity to engage is being facilitated when states feel that it's safe for them to do so and it's beneficial for them to do so. But they won't necessarily really take part when they feel like they have to preference their, their sovereign position over the compliance. And so the two examples that were given a lot in the literature was that Indonesia refusing to initially share the virus samples of H5N1 and then China's initial reluctance to share the full extent of the outbreak of SARS back in 2003. So there was this sense that, yes, states will move a bit forward in this area, but don't forget sovereignty will still be the overarching, you know, um, norm to which they do comply and always follow. And if they have to choose between protecting their state and the, the, the governance regime from criticism, they will do that over uh, compliance with these instruments. The second argument that was emerging was that, well, yes, we're seeing this region engaging in a fair amount of talk and discussion, but a lot of skepticism about whether or not that's leading to actual action. So, you know, we're seeing uh, lots of joint statements. We're seeing um, sometimes even the creation of funding mechanisms, but are we seeing countries actually really substantively change their behavior? Then the third argument that was emerging, so they're saying we're seeing local adaptation where states sort of take on a few of the rules to suit themselves. And then the third one that we saw was that, well, this is just about an episodic, episodic response. It's securitization in practice. This is a transit, this is a, an existential threat. Uh, it's about protecting economies. It's about protecting um, your state from, you know, extreme trade and travel measures. And so they're cooperating to be ready for that. It's not necessarily that they buy into the whole idea of responsibility or human security. It's about for them being able to ultimately protect the state. So it's a little bit of column one and a little bit of column three, but column three is very much about um, they will partake in it, they will engage in it, but there's limits uh, to what they will do. 
not necessarily always sovereign. It's also about the, the threat and how much they feel threatened by that outbreak. So neighboring states as well. So there's a lot of discussion about, we're seeing securitization language being very deliberately deployed in the health security context in the region to try and move states beyond the sovereignty rules perspective. And that will work, but it will only really work in your big emergency. So don't expect too much in the peacetime. For me, that was really interesting because I wanted to see then, well, how do these explanations then bear out? I felt that maybe some of them rang true, but I was a little bit concerned about the way in which they were selecting their cases. And I'll come to that next. So first of all, for me, then it was about trying to understand who was I wanting to look at and why was I wanting to look at them. Um, the WHO and ASEAN for me was quite an interesting partnership that I'd seen emerge in these early days of IHR implementation discussions. So the two WHO regional offices, uh, WIPRO, Western Pacific Regional Office and the Southeast Asia Regional Office in 2005 had agreed at WIPRO's suggestion to create an Asia Pacific strategy for emerging diseases called APSED in 20, 2005. And this was set up to promote uh, compliance with the IHR and to adapt states' very different capacities, so different public health systems, different income levels, different infectious disease burdens, and to think about then how you could develop a regional discussion and a regional agenda around IHR compliance that states could meet and discuss in a continued way for a period of five years. So APSED had a five year phase and they had technical discussions and they were to select out of the eight core capacities, some capacities that were seen to be ones that could develop regional focus and uh, regional engagement. And so it was quite an important um, instrument, I thought, what was trying to be done here. It was unique too in that it was it deliberately sought out the engagement and the participation of political partners and in particular I noted the Association of Southeast Asian Nations a secretariat was brought in to these discussions and that was partly because you had uh, ASEAN states that is sitting in some in Wipro and some in Cerro and I didn't know this at the time but when I went and did interviews, one of the things that was discussed was that there was a real desire to ensure that this program tapped, tapped into existing political arrangements to which states were familiar and comfortable and ensured that those regional organizations were reinforcing and re-embedding the types of discussions that were happening around APSED. So for me, the question that I wanted to try and understand, which is what this book is about, is about understanding how did a group of states within APSED, the ASEAN states, which I think are interesting because there are some, three of them sat in WIPRO, seven of them sat in WIPRO, three of them sat in CERO. How did they, with their different capacities, their different health systems, and at the time, their very different understandings of the IHR and what they had to do to be compliant, come together and understand their obligation to the IHR. And in particular, what I identify is that in APSED phase one, surveillance and reporting, which was a combined capacity of the IHR, so there was two capacities that were combined and seen as being an area that the region could agree to, that irrespective of capacity, it was seen as something that all states needed to improve because the IHR requires within a 24 and 48 hour context, you're able to detect and respond to a WHO request for information on a novel outbreak. And for me, what was also particularly interesting about the question with surveillance and reporting is that it brings into question the types of explanations that perhaps might clash uh, when we see states have to implement it in practice. So the idea that you have to engage in reporting uh, an outbreak that you've detected on your soil uh, in compliance with the IHR specifications of doing that within a certain period of time, that you have to actually show that you can do it, because if you can't show that you can do it, who has the right to come back and repeatedly request information for you to bring forward? And non-state actors can report 
uh, to the World Health Organization as well now under this new IHR. And it was also interesting to me to see to what extent this was being developed in peacetime, because again, the expectation was that you're preparing states to be ready. So there's a lot of emphasis in the app said that this is something that states need to be doing in peacetime. And so I was really interested to see how that would work in a context where we were expecting most of the action to really only happen under threat. The way in which I went around doing this in practice was two, two areas. For me, it was really important to count, to, to, to look at behavior. So I very much approached this from a constructivist background. For me, it's, this is a normative project where I'm trying to understand the introduction of formal rules, but I'm also trying to understand as well how they are engaging with them at a social level and how are they thinking about their implementation formally, but also informally through practice and observation and shared exchange amongst the states. So I'm wanting to do a count of surveillance and reporting practices. And this was informed by a lot of the research that was being done at the time by people like Emily Chan and others who were trying to document how states were starting to shift their behavior from surveillance and reporting pre-IHR 2005 to surveillance and reporting IHR 2005 moving forward. And one of the things that was talked about was that we need to pay attention to how states, how quickly they report a number of different outbreak events. Those that are endemic, so things like dengue, which Vitru mentioned earlier, but also your novel outbreaks like SARS and like H5N1 and your ones that they don't know. So a diarrheal outbreak, an influenza outbreak, and how are they being reported? And when what happens? Do they shift from then being suspected to confirmed? And then also, are states doing these reports or are we seeing that media is doing these reports and then states follow up? Or is it that infectious disease surveillance networks like ProMed and HealthMap, uh, which have been very important then are still are important today for detecting these rumors of outbreaks, particularly in areas where there may be censorship or where there may be problems around getting reports out through the state. So it was interesting to me to see in this region amongst these 10 states, how were states reporting outbreaks and how did it change over a period of time? So I had a list of about 10 diseases that I identified through the Annex 2 of the IHR, uh, the revised IHR, but I also had some endemic diseases that the APSED report had listed, including dengue and Japanese encephalitis. And I documented how states and how uh, surveillance platform sites and how media over a period of time from 1998 to 2013 we're reporting these outbreak events in the 10 countries. So it was a lot of counting that <laughs> um, I'll talk about later what I was, what I found. And I also documented how often states reported what they found to the World Health Organization. What I also wanted to do in this project was try and understand uh, the discussions of implementation. So counts tell me what they're doing what I wanted to also understand was the decision-making processes behind what got reported. And in particular, I wanted to know uh, to what extent those outbreak events where there was a lot of rumors about what states knew and didn't report, how much of that was actually bearing through in terms of what states were actually doing, what decisions they were making when they decided not to report or when they delayed a report. And so in a lot of the regional meetings that I was fortunate to attend, um, I sort of went around to uh, every meeting that I could be allowed to attend as an observer. So there was a lot of ASEAN and APSED meetings to which I'm grateful that I was able to attend. I would go around asking questions to those who were present. And I think just observation wise, what was interesting about those meetings over that period of time was you had a very, you had horizontal and vertical representation. So you had states representatives, you had civil society representatives sometimes, not often. Uh, you had different levels within states. So you could have medium level officials to high level officials, and you had a variety of people from labs, to public service, to health practitioners. And I think that degree of difference and, and variability in terms of who was attending these meetings 
was quite important and it was beneficial for me because I got to hear a lot of different observations, sometimes within the same country, about what was happening. Very briefly, why I did this approach. For me, it was about the interviews was about triangulating with what I was counting. So it was trying to also observe perhaps the types of power relationships and other types of relationships that may have been happening in terms of media and state, uh, the World Health Organization and state. So if we see a five day delay in a reporting of a H5N1 outbreak, for me, the interviews allowed me to go and ask these questions in a more direct and meaningful way about why did we see these delays? Could you recall what happened? Could you explain to me what was the process? The counting also for me was important because it was about challenging some of the observations that I'd seen in the literature that I felt was a little bit problematic. So in terms of the sovereign rules context, I felt that what we were seeing here was a lot of focus on one state in one instance, not maybe thinking about that state over a long period of time and thinking about how that state's behaviour was mimicking or positioned compared to others. So for me, the point of comparison and the regional trends was a very important part of this project. I also felt that the behavioural change was too focused perhaps on your formal measures. And for me, it was really important when this is about a long-term institutional change and practice normative change, which I believe the IHR is, it's really important to understand the informal changes, the types of behaviours and rationales that were going on in people's minds as to what they prioritise what they thought mattered and how did they make the decisions that they made when they were faced with these um, peacetime, but also, you know, emergency situations. And then I also felt that that was the other thing that we needed to understand better is in the peacetime, how, what, what got prioritized, what got done, because then that allows us to then understand the security in the, in the emergency, what's missing. And it also allows us to understand as well, whether or not what we think is going to be the priority and states are going to want to have in place in an outbreak, is that actually the case? So does it work as we presume it would? By the end of the book, what I start to then detail is the findings. And what I find is two, three things that I think are worth bearing out. And I think the graphs represent this okay, I hope. I had a number of graphs I could have picked, but I went for these two and I hope it does the trick. The first thing that I think is really interesting to note is that states have definitely tried to own the reporting process in a way that was quite different to the beginning of this period of time that I started doing the counting. So in some states, it's actually become, it's become inverse and it's flipped. So you had a lot of rumors and a lot of informal reporting often taking place in Indonesia and Philippines, and to some extent, even in Malaysia. What you've seen here is an attempt by the state to try and report earlier and report more often and to report even outbreak events that they're not yet certain of. And for me, that was a quite a, a, quite a direct shift and change from what I'd seen in the first phase of reporting to then what you see post IHR in the second phase of reporting. So there's an attempt by the state to try and own the, 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 the surveillance and reporting space and own it in a way where you see media decreasing the number of RIMA reports and increasing the number of reports relating to the state. And then you see also uh, infectious disease surveillance networks still have a very important role to play at those first sites of detection and those first sites of rumours. And they tend to be quite good at getting the information or the, or the, the, the sense of that there could be a, something novel happening. And that's usually because those types of reports are coming from independent observers within the epidemiological or laboratory field. So there's still a really important space here for allowing non-state actors to, to report uh, because they often do come forward in situations where the state is not yet wanting to give a report because they're not yet entirely sure of that they can't verify it. And so we're often seeing a few laps here between what a state is willing to come out and report as verified versus what they think is suspect. And that's where these informal networks, particularly these surveillance platforms still have a role to play. But overall, states have moved forward in terms of the regular reporting of your endemics diseases. So dengue in particular was one, but 
In some places, Japanese encephalitis has gone up as well, though there's still problems here. And that was seen as really important because that normalization of reporting during peacetime is meant to hopefully support and, and, and enforce the capacity to report in an emergency. So the state is definitely, uh, I, I would argue, has claimed this role. And there is definitely attempt to try and improve the time gap between what the state knows and then telling World Health Organization what the state knows. Um, there's also been an attempt, I would argue, to really enhance capacity in this area. So it's not just about knowing the story first so that no one else knows it. It's also about being able to develop the types of capacity in terms of fieldwork training, in terms of the chain of command of how reporting needs to be circulated within the government to ensure then that there is a process where the national focal point is then able to report to the executive as well as to the World Health Organization what they're observing. And to some extent that explains why we see the self-surveillance of states in this area has increased. So that's your second graph. There is this sense of trying to improve productivity. There's also this sense as well in the region of the need to demonstrate compliance with the IHR core capacities. And this region, again, um, even if you look at the CERO and RIPWA, when you see that those numbers may maybe not be as high, it's usually not because uh, the vast majority of ASEAN states are failing to self-report or failing to engage in the process. And one of the things that have been really interesting about the discussions with IHR capacities, which I'll return to later, is what are we trying to measure here? Are we trying to measure that states are self-reporting and getting full marks? Or are we trying to measure that states are critically analyzing what they're good at and what they need help with? And they're reporting, maybe not an A-star report, they're reporting they've got a few Ds and Cs, they need to improve. And that in itself may be a good thing. And I'll come back to that later, but there certainly is a demonstration here that the region over this period of time was engaging with the idea of that annual measurement and needing to report on how they were progressing. And you see some states vary in terms of their responses here as well, which may indicate lessons learned or a critical engagement with the process. So for me, in terms of the findings of my book, what I think is really important to hear is actually to identify that the attempt to try and normalize cooperation in cooperation resistant areas was the task of APSED. And I think it was actually quite successfully managed because it was actually a confrontation, if you like, with the types of barriers that were predicted as being constraints on that cooperation. So there was a recognition particularly I found through interviews when I explained to them what I'd been observing in terms of the counts, there was an acknowledgement that yes, the way in which it was couched was that states do need to own the surveillance and reporting process because they don't want to be surprised. They have to do a step change and how they see their responsibility to manage the outbreak events and to communicate it to populations because actually this could be an indication of state incapacity if they aren't able to get there to get so and this was very much the way it was which was presented so some states i observed within the h5n1 period started to really rapidly increase their levels of reporting and detection so vietnam and indonesia in particular went through a step change from reporting outbreaks that they were verified to then outbreaks that were suspected and this was part of the story of the journey here about trying to normalize that states need to communicate what they know, even if they don't yet fully know what they know, what they don't know. So that was very much an attempt then to try and, if you like, circumvent the idea that states will want to close down and not report because they didn't want to admit what they didn't know. The attempt in this first phase was to try and overcome that reluctance to do so. And there were very different interpretations of this. And near the end of my interviews, there was still a lot of concern that there needed to be more time spent on this. Um, and I'll come back to later, there wasn't necessarily as much time as there could have been. Local adaptation, the inclusion of ASEAN was deliberate because there wasn't a sense that ASEAN at the time was going through its own charter reform. It was doing going through a step change in terms of upscaling the way in which it was devolving responsibility across the three pillars. The creation of new committees and new communities 
was the chance, if you like, to attach APSED to the ASEAN health agenda and to foster as well, and this was quite openly talked about actually, which surprised me, that this was about fostering peer-to-peer -peer cooperation, but also competition. There was this sense that ASEAN was another avenue through which ASEAN states would be regularly meeting much more than what they were through the APSED process. And this was an opportunity to get states to see how they were performing against each other. So there was definitely a desire in the absence of having, if you like, um, sticks that could be applied. So states had to do certain things to be a member. There wasn't any of that in this relationship. What was the desire instead was to foster that peer-to-peer -peer competition. That was the only carrot, if you like, that they had to dangle here. The other area that I thought was quite interesting in response to the securitization was this desire to really create a sense of urgency in the endemic areas. And I thought dengue in particular was one to which there was a lot of attention and a lot of focus. And I think that tails off by the second and third phase. But I think in the first phase, that focus on endemic diseases was quite important and quite pivotal because it gave states a sense of seeing action right now in front of them. And that overcame the barriers that we may have seen with the securitization risk. The fourth area that I think is missing from the literature and isn't talked about is that even in the absence, even in the face of sovereign local adaptation and securitization barriers that may still be there, I felt that what was important about this period of time was the deliberate attempt to try and foster trust, to create simulation exercises, to create discrete forum opportunities, to exchange lessons learned, to openly talk about situations within government where there's executive resistance, where there may be um, efforts to try and censor information. And those talk shops, as they were described sometimes in a way that was quite disparaging, I felt were actually quite important moments and quite important that we don't often talk about. They can't be measured. But for me, there was a lot of discussion and observation on my part of seeing particular individuals from states raise in a, in a round table discussion, what do I do when my minister says X, Y, Z? Or what do I do when my executive has a law that prevents me from being able to report under Article 11 or 12 of the World Health Organization, IHR? So these types of conversations can't be recorded, they can't be captured in a report, but there was a convert, there was an opportunity in those meetings for other countries of similar political regimes or similar issues around censorship to have those discussions and talk about how they manage it. And I think that was a really important part of this process. Now, the problem is the criticism. And then can I, can I ask Victory, do I have 10 minutes? Is that right? Yay, okay, thank you. So the problems, right? Okay, so you noticed I said before that the emphasis on endemic diseases was quite important, but that's a problem in terms of funding. So one of the things that I find near the end of the book is that APSED was starting to run out of steam, and particularly by 2010, 2015, the second phase, um, you could see that there was more emphasis and more drive to really try and improve the measurements of the IHR, like, you know, you see a step change in donors and you see even a step change in some of the ASEAN members and, and, and WIPRO and CERO members. If we're meeting every year to do this. Let's talk more about how we're really doing and not give ourselves 100% every time for meeting the core capacities. Let's talk honestly, because you're definitely not 100% and I am 100%. So I don't want to be compared 100% to your 100%. So you see then these types of problems start to emerge where securitization is episodic and people are not starting to feel the panic that they felt the need to meet. The measurements are becoming problematic. They're starting to become some sense in the evaluations of these programs, that the measures are a progress of what? Of a state congratulating themselves for doing a great job when they may not necessarily be doing so. Um, there was also a sense as well that the IHR itself was an end with no, there was no end in sight as to when the measurements and the reporting would stop. Um, and this was partly because you had a fair amount of time. You had H1N1, which didn't end up being quite the emergency that everyone, the pandemic that everyone thought it was going to be. You had the Ebola outbreak, which was largely contained in West Africa. 
So there was a sense, and there was, you know, a sense as well that, that the reason why the response in West Africa had failed in the first few months to the Ebola outbreak was not just because those states had failed, but also the World Health Organization headquarters itself had, had dropped the ball a bit. So there was a sense in this region that they're kind of, they're traveling okay. They're doing well. So again, you're starting to get these different senses emerging in this region about how everyone sees themselves handling the IHR compliance and how they see their neighbors as handling it. So that sense of consensus, that sense of emergency, it's starting to, they're starting to see a bit of slippage combined with donor slippage as well. Focus and attention for that period of time really turned to what was going on in the Ebola outbreak. And then when it came back to this region, it was about trying to think again more critically about IHR compliance rather than trying to develop a regional response to IHR compliance. So the, re the response became more of a, a world response, a global response, rather than a tailored regional response, I argue. And then I think also what was, was problematic for me, because I'm a human security scholar, was that we don't have a lot of focus and attention on the critical work that was being done by civil society organizations, uh, by unpaid healthcare workers, by individuals who are trying to operate in environments where it's very politically restrictive for them to do so. And the IHR didn't seem to have any capacity to answer what do we do in those environments? What do we do in the environments where surveillance and reporting, the state may be building its capacity, but it's building its capacity to censor. It's not building its capacity to report better. It's building its capacity to make sure that people can't tell anyone what's going on. Um, so for me, the, there was an absence in this program and there was an absence even at the World Health Organization and headquarters around how health as a human right can be thought about in the IHR context and can be realized here as well. What do we do for the health official who is going to think twice about reporting if their job and their family are at risk? You know, we don't really, we didn't have a lot of discussion around that. So for me, in terms of what I was observing in terms of counts, yes, I'm observing a linear trend here. Everyone's reporting more. But I was concerned, you know, about the instances and the environments where that reporting was getting more and more managed by a state that may not necessarily want to be communicating with its population what's going on if it felt that it may at any point threaten or raise questions about its capacity. And I think that's where we then get to COVID-19. So these problems were not resolved. We'd seen very important effort to try and uptake response, uh, but we haven't necessarily answered some of the underlying problems. And I think where we're at with, co with COVID-19 is more questions. And I'm, that's my kind of my cop out, I suppose, as, as a scholar in this environment is, um, is to say, what we need to do is more research. But I think what I think is important here in my last five minutes to think about is what has been learnt in that peacetime observation that I've just told you about? What measures do seem to be mattering in the moment of this crisis right now? And what is our core capacity to respond? So, in terms of the IHR, it actually is important to talk about the fact that the IHR itself has gone through quite a step change. Those criticisms around the capacities and the benchmarks has led to a new way now of analyzing how states manage their reporting of the IHR. But what we're seeing though, so now states have to report their compliance of their capacity against benchmarks. And these benchmarks are set through the World Health Assembly and through the World Health Organization and headquarters. And you have to show that you have actually met benchmark one, two, three, before you can go up in terms of your capacity to respond to an area such as, yes, I've done legislative reform, but maybe I've only changed some of the legislation, not all of it. So you have to show now that you've progressed across these benchmarks in each of the capacities. And they've extended the capacities now from eight to 13, and there's 24 indicators. 
And one of the reasons this has happened is because now the IHR core capacity is part of the Sustainable Development Goal in 2030. So now states are expected to show that they are meeting these capacities against the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals framework. So that's also been a bit of a step change here. And because of the funding and the emphasis on indicators with the SDGs, we're seeing a lot of emphasis on bilateral evaluations. So ASEAN states, have all agreed independently to go through the joint external evaluation exercise that the World Health Organization does, which is about five to 10 people arrive in a country, stay there for a week and evaluate the state against their reported SPA. So it's about looking at, this is what the state is saying that they can do against the IHRs. We're gonna do a joint external evaluation and see if what they say is true. And there's been a few interesting studies on this where some states, some reports have said that you're getting maybe a, a difference in terms of reported capacity between 1.5 and 5. So, you know, states are kind of giving themselves a little bit more pat on the back, but it's not actually a massive difference. And actually, I would argue that some of the reports that have been done on this have found not, I would argue, a significant big change. It seems for the most state part, states seem to be kind of accurately reporting where they're at, which then to me brings us back to a bigger problem, I guess, around what is it that we're seeking to get from these core capacities? Because for me, what's interesting at the moment is that some of the core capacities that states are reporting that they don't have capacity in, like zoonotic events, chemical events, human resources, um, some of these are quite important ones, particularly the zoonotic events. So what's happening when states are continually reporting that they're not meeting their capacity in this? National Health Emergency Framework is another one that states tend to be not reporting high scores in. Um, so I think a lot more substantive discussion about all this reporting, all these capacities, and what are we then, how, how soon do we want to see action from them? But I also think even in the real capacities where states are showing that they are doing well, such as surveillance and reporting, and this outbreak has shown that it's, there's a need to maybe sometimes be aware of the fact that, um, that maybe we need to return to some of these capacities again and look at them a bit more substantively in terms of what have they done, what, what worked and what hasn't worked, even in the capacities where we're seeing, you know, 70 to 100% compliance. And that's just a picture there. I'm going to provide these slides so people can pour over this graph later on if they like. And it've also, it's come from the World Health Organization eSPAR tool. In terms of this region, what I think is important to acknowledge then is that I would argue that what we're seeing here is the type of variation that I found in my project, I'd say, is happening at the moment with COVID, which is that we had about four ASEAN states reporting the, out, the, the what they were detecting of this outbreak before the VH declared on the 30th of January. Then we had six that then followed, and those six that then followed were in March. So we had four rush out in January, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Singapore, and then the remaining six came out more slowly, I think it would be fair to say, in March. And so there's a lot of questions here around, I think to be answered around, what were the cause of those delays? Is this a capacity issue? Is this an understanding issue? Is this a, um, a matter of political regime or the way in which states are governed? I think what's absent from a lot of the IHR discussion at the moment is the politics of implementation capacity. It's not just about making sure that you've got technical proficiency. It's also that awareness of what is your political regime and how is it set up to be able to meet the types of capacity. I also think as well, what we could be saying is fair to say as well, is that trust in the system is also becoming an increasingly important feature in the COVID outbreak with trust in the testing and trust in the information and how much leeway do certain states have around this trusting arrangement. There's also an issue here in terms of Surveillance and reporting is not the same thing as that long-term capacity testing that COVID is requiring. And I think, again, it returns back to the IHR was designed to be able to be applicable, those core capacities to any type of environment. And I think what COVID is exposing is that actually different disease outbreaks require different levels of functionality and capacity. And we need to understand that in a much better way, in a more deep and meaningful way. And I would also suggest as well that what this indicates too is that we need to really pay a lot more attention to the risk communication aspect of disease outbreak reporting as well. So 
How much do people feel like they can come forward to get tested? Are they aware of the cost involved or the absence of cost involved? How much is the state communicating this information to its people? So a lot of the discussion and engagement around IHR has been about state's capacity to respond to the IHR framework. And I think what we need to be doing more is thinking about state's capacity to respond to its people's needs. And I think that part of the element of IHR is perhaps missing a bit. And we're seeing that come out in the COVID uh, outbreak at the moment. And so when I look at the ASEAN response and I think about how we're doing, and I've got two more slides and then I'm done, Fitri. Uh, I think the first thing to note, and I really do appreciate the work of, of Dr. Spire because I've been reading those commentaries quite regularly and they're much more informed than anything I'm saying here. For me, what's interesting with the ASEAN response and the narrative is that it, you're kind of getting a spectrum of responses here where some of the community are saying, this is great. If we go back here and we look at how this region is doing, we're seeing that yes, there are some states that are perhaps not coming forward with the full scale of reporting. Upscale testing is maybe not as good, but we're not seeing a massive type of um, crisis that we may have predicted and may have expected to see if we hadn't spent the last 10 to 15 years, continually talking again and again and again about outbreak response as part of our humanitarian and disaster response measures. If we didn't have that said, if we didn't have these types of mechanisms. So it's interesting for me to see that one group is saying, look, there are problems, but you know, I think you know, at the end of the day, we should congratulate ourselves there's been a little bit of an attempt here. You've had AHO, you had a couple of days ago, you had ACWC come out and issue a statement on domestic violence. So, you know, you've had an ASEAN engaged and responding. Um, on the flip side, you've had a critique of what is absent in terms of ASEAN's response. So there is that sense of, again, lots of talk, lots of meetings, but it's not particularly clear that there's coordination, that there's an effort to say, we as a block will do this around testing. We as a block will do that around lockdowns. There is also this sense of crisis around the funding and the direction of ASEAN. What can ASEAN do? What do we want ASEAN to be able to do? What are states willing to cede to ASEAN to be able to do? And there's that lack of discussion, the lack of discussion around that for some indicates an absence of ASEAN having progressed. The ASEAN that is responding today is the ASEAN in some respects that was responding back in 2009. And there's that sense maybe of frustration that could more have been asked of ASEAN. I think also what's being interesting is being asked at the moment is that ASEAN itself may be being hampered by the way in which it's structured within the World Health Organization. And I think that's an interesting argument. I'm not entirely sure that's the case, but it's interesting one that I'm hearing emerging and that the US and China tensions is, is inhibiting the type of coordination amongst ASEAN members. And I think it's particularly interesting to hear that discussion being circulated around those countries that reported in March, that there's a lot of attachment to the reason why some of these countries reported in March was because they didn't want to offend China. So my last slide, what's next? I think, I'm gonna say that there needs to be more research, but I genuinely do. Um, I think, what I haven't done and what needs to be done is that in-depth comparative study of states here. We need to know more about how states are interpreting their IHR capacities, how the step change to the JEE and the SPA has affected the way in which states do critically evaluate their capacity, the degree of knowledge within community, within states around what this IHR is and how IHR may or may not have helped with COVID response. We assume we actually know a lot of this because we've got all these benchmarks and indicators, but I argue actually that we don't. We don't know enough about the way in which scientists within laboratories, civil society upon who we rely upon to communicate, media interpretation of their roles and responsibilities around outbreak response. I would argue that while the state, you know, there's been a piece written by David Runciman about the return of the state under COVID. And I think that's true, but we have to still acknowledge that we've all got very different states. And that is changing and affecting then the way in which people understand what they can ask of their state and what their state feels responsibility to provide. And I think in COVID, it's really important that we don't assume that the IHR is this universal template that we can just plonk down. There actually is gonna be much of variation and much different ways in which it's being understood and observed, uh, absorbed. And I think 
particularly so in this region, because I argue that because that effort in the first phase to try and pursue a regional arrangement has diminished over time to it being more a bilateral one, that states show that they're doing what they need to do to be donor compliant and to be World Health Assembly compliant, rather than talking to the region around how they're going. And then finally, I think my last observations on what's happening in COVID actually reflects that. I think we nearly need to acknowledge that the ones that seem to be doing well at the moment have that institutional memory of an outbreak response. They have gone through it very recently and we shouldn't diminish that experience, how important that is and communicating that experience to others. Fast thinking executive decision making seems to be a very important role in this process. And again, that's not something that's talked about in the IHR and I think it, it needs to be. And again, my point on coordinated risk communication and a human rights focused risk communication strategy needs to be really important. So thank you so much. I think I went well over time, sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying I wouldn't. <laughs> well, I try to stop you, but then it's too interesting. I actually think your presentation actually answered a lot of people's question here in Indonesia, at least that I know, why is the national intelligent body is involved in actually conducting testing? It's just news coming out that the uh, it's like uh, Australian ICO, um, the Indonesian bin is actually conducting rest testing and in Surabaya they're still prolonging their testing time and we're kind of thinking like, why is the intelligent agency? And I mean, I, I don't think as a public that are uh, well aware, even the media doesn't know uh, why the, the National um, Intelligence Agency is, is involved. And, and you actually open our eyes, at least my eyes, that, oh, it's, it's actually demanded by the international health regulation, right? And then you have all the, the Asia Pacific um, a disease uh, agreement that that requires state to to follow, follow through, and and I think it's really interesting, and and I I think uh, for that reason for the um, for your very interesting presentation, there are many questions. The similar tone, uh, most of them are questioning about the the state reporting, like. Uh, how it has been a practice of surveillance. And then uh, I will um, raise the question by first by, by Dandy uh, regarding uh, uh, one main, main challenge of COVID response in Southeast Asia is there is a low confidence on the official data provided by the government, in particular during the early stages, at least in uh, Indonesia. Um, there are allegations that some governments are deliberately giving misleading information that made even worse by terrible communication strategy adopted by some countries. And, um, and what do you think about this? And then similarly, not only Dandi Rafitrandi asked this question, um, Romi Akbar also asked uh, the same question. Uh, what is the international institution like the WHO um, uh, have, has to ensure the accountability of state report? Uh, and and uh, and Alexander de Tayoga also uh, continue on saying, uh, arguing forward that state has power, interests, and fear regarding the outbreak. Right. So so how how we 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 deal with this mix? Uh, and, and I want to know what your take on that. I think we want to know. Uh, if you can please enlighten us. <laughs> Thank you. So one of the things that I argued in the book was that um, the presumption that you'd have democratic regimes do better in reporting and non-democratic regimes uh, not do better in reporting was not necessarily true, uh, which was quite, at least in the ASEAN context. And for me, that was uh, a little bit alarming um but what i said though was that one of the things that seemed to definitely be true though was that the opportunity for challenge the opportunity to question the opportunity to have a discourse around the accuracy of the reporting seemed to definitely be more available in your democratic regimes than in your non-democratic regimes so for me, one of the things that I said was really important is when we're thinking about even if a state is not doing a good job in reporting, 
would you rather be in a democratic state where it's not doing a good job or would you like to be in a non-democratic state that's not doing a good job of its reporting? And one of the arguments that I think is that I would make is that you want to be in a democratic state because you can challenge and you can argue and you can expose without fear, hopefully, of imprisonment or um, arrest or losing your position by challenging the system and saying it's not doing a good enough job. Now, that's not the same as a perfect situation where your country is doing a good job with official data and it's doing a good job in releasing it. But I argue that one of the things that we mustn't, that it's really important to keep track of is that a democratic country that's doing a bad job at communication and doing a bad job with it reporting its official data has the chance to improve and has a chance to reform through that engagement, through that critique, through the opportunity available through the media and hopefully the academe to challenge it. Um, and that's where it becomes really important. And I argue very strongly that we haven't thought enough about that. How do we do that? How do we mobilize that? How do we strengthen that? Because we know that it actually has been very important even during this outbreak that there has been moments where scientists, there have been moments where um, advisors even in some countries have challenged the report or have challenged the story. And that's been really important turning points for either upscaling testing or important points for um, reversing. And we're also seeing, I think, which is really important as well at the moment, is that some states that are meant to be democratic are starting to try and tighten information and tighten media reports and not giving out case fatality rates and these sorts of things. And I think it is really worrying. And I think it is concerning when this is happening. And I think that there is a need again, for us to be promoting the idea within our communities, but also to follow on to the second question about the World Health Organization, to be making it very clear, they do have a responsibility in this area to be indicating what information states should be providing to their citizens. And it's interesting to me that with Mike Ryan, who's head of the emergencies program, we did actually see in one of his media out reports, perhaps it was after Brazil made the announcement that they were going to revert back to only weekly um, reports, I think that's right, around the case fatalities. He made a, com a comment that wasn't widely reported, but it's there on YouTube where he says, Brazil people have the right to information about their outbreak events. They have the right to know what is happening. We can't lose focus of the fact that the state is there to monitor a report for you. And he made this call. And I think it's interesting that he did it and not the WHO Director General Tedros uh, Gabriasis. And I think it would have been nice if maybe the WHO Director General Gabriasis had said this. So I think there is, um, and I think it is important actually that, that there are these moments where states are reminded through other area, through other people, through your technical capacity or institutions like who, of what their obligations are. Um, but of course, you know, it, it, it is a highly contested space. And I think we've seen this with COVID, you know, from the United States to China, to Brazil, to the UK. Um, you know, there is a lot of contestation at the moment around uh, what data people need to see, what demands they can make around testing. Um, and I think it's really, we're still all struggling at the moment to catch up with this uh, and to understand it. But I would say that for me, what's been interesting is that is the fact that I still feel that even in those situations where we have low confidence in official data, um, I think I'm still of the view after having looked at the, this region for the last 15 years, that those chances to challenge and those chances to have the conversation about what data is missing is a much better opportunity to have that conversation in a democratic state. It's very hard to have that conversation in a non-democratic state. And I can think of a state in particular, and I think uh, Dr. Safia has written about this in her April report, you know, where there is one state in particular where there's a wrestle at the moment between the democratically elected government and the military around who gets to decide the response. And, you know, and that's a really worrying trend. You know, we don't, you know, so I think it's one thing to have criticism of our state and the lack of data, but I think we also need to remember that we've got certain institutions available to us to then demand better data. 
And there are certain countries that don't have those institutions. And those are the places where I, I, I worry twofold. I worry in our situations where we don't have the data, but I worry in those countries where we don't have the data and we've got no mechanism to challenge the data. Thank you, Sarah. It's amazing answer. And like, I, I want to actually comment on that answer first. Uh, that you said about democratic country has the chance to demand their leader to be um, transparent and then publish information because it's the right of the people. But you know, it's only on election. And uh, yeah, yeah. if you already choose the leader and then you have to wait for the next election, people probably would die already, and which is sad. And and what you, <laughs> I mean, I, then, I would argue, no, that's really, do you think, because I don't, you know, do you think that there is no other avenue through which uh, politicians can be held accountable? So there's no member of parliament process. There's no, um, there's no local government process. There's no other process through which you can seek alternative um, challenge to the response. Um, well, um, I was actually going to comment about uh, about the military uh, country that uh, struggle with the military. So in Southeast Asia, at least there is three country uh, that uh, struggle with its military uh, or coup or military power, which is Indonesia, Myanmar, and Thailand. So yeah, maybe those country you can see how the number in those country actually being reported and and what are the agency that they actually uh, um, put forward as the, the frontliner in um, detecting uh, COVID cases? Um, yeah, I, you, about your, and your question about, uh, is there not a, any other mechanism? I think, I think because government has power, what we see in this country is countries or nation that is democratic, pseudo-democratic. So, it's kind of um, they would create like legislation that enable them to act as what you mentioned in your presentation, doing censorship, which is quite sad, and then limit the internet um, and the media, and, and which is really sad. But uh, you're, you're raising a, a question about um, accountability, right? And we have a question from Romy Akbar asking about uh, How's the power or the position of WHO, a World Health Organization, in ensuring the accountability of the state's reporting and surveillance? And and uh, I have um, this question um, from uh, personal uh, our, our intern uh, at CSIS, Maria Margareta, that asked um, in in uh, do um furthering this accountability, how, how much the, the media can affect country's behavior in responding to the emergency situation, especially during this, the pandemic. Um, and, and because you know the, the media, um, the situation of the media and, and how, how, would you, how would you think the media can give breakthrough, you know? Um, um, yeah, I think the you. chance no, to... that's And this is, I mean, I think again, I think, um, thank you for sharing your experience of what you're observing in Indonesia. I'm not there. And so I'm really keen to hear what, you know, what, what everyone is feeling and they're experiencing over there. And because as well, I know that there's a lot that's written in Indonesian language that I can't read. Um, so I really do appreciate your insight in terms of how you're feeling about the response there at the moment. So thank you. So I'm, when I ask those questions, I'm genuinely wanting to know what you think could be done. And I've been reading a lot about how particular civil society groups and how particular local governments try and activate their own type of response. But I know that's limited. And I know that has a lot of constraints and, and problems too, right, in its response. So thank you for sharing that with me. Um, in terms of the accountability for reporting, this is a great question. <laughs> and it's one that uh, dominated a lot of my attention during my uh, book. And perhaps that's what some would say is maybe uh, a flaw in the sense that what I can't, what I couldn't grasp and what I think we're all still struggling to grasp is how do we make sure that states are compliant and that they feel a sense of obligation to be compliant and to be held accountable? For me, what was important about that first five-year period of that said 
was the regularity with which states were meeting, uh, the regularity with which different states were engaging with each other. It was very, very difficult uh, to be in those environments and not for someone to be knowing or raising a situation where there had been an outbreak, and particularly H5N1 was discussed a lot when I was there and H1N1 was discussed a lot when I was there because there were some states, it's important to acknowledge, and I've brushed, I didn't go into detail, but there were some states that did not report H1N1 outbreaks. So they left it about eight to 10 weeks before they reported what we now think was when they first had the outbreak. And what was then interesting in those environments and in those exchanges were when it was asked or when it was raised why there was a delay. And it often wasn't in your formal processes. It was often in your informal workshop talk environments where it would be discussed. And you would hear then the issues around uh, capacity, the issues around understanding of the law or understanding of the, the instrument and or, or resistance, political resistance to reporting what was going on. But then what was also interesting was that they would sometimes say, so then it would be like, so why did you report then? If, you know, it was eight weeks on, why did you? And they would say, well, because we had to show that we, we did have the capacity. We did have to show that we knew what was happening, that we weren't completely unable to test. We could, we had to show we could test. Um, and I think, you know, to me, what that was an indication of was that there is some acknowledgement, there's some knowledge going on that they have to show some capacity to do this work, but they factor in how long they can wait or how long they can hold off or when the political environment, the machinery moves to allow them to then report, you know, once it's gone through, because one person was saying, you know, it was about three committees that they had to move through. And then there actually was a situation where one committee did not get convened until a week later, despite it being at the time, a really important emergency. Um, you know, so I think as well, we can't, forget that health doesn't always have a high level status in some environments, uh, that the people within the health don't always have a high level status. So we're working sometimes with some institutional problems here or some institutional legacies that then lead to gaps in the system and that lead to perceptions that the accountability measure is not that high or that everyone is not watching you that much. It's not until an emergency like now with COVID where all of a sudden what we would permit to be a two week delay with a dengue outbreak, we're now saying, no, it needs to be tomorrow. We need to know now. And so you've got to get everyone all of a sudden to scale up uh, from working sometimes on minimal budgets with minimal level of position of power and minimal level of authority to now all of a sudden being told you are the most important people in the room and you've got to be working at this, you know, 100 times level capacity that you're working at before. So there's been a lot of discussion about, it's not necessarily about accountability, it can sometimes be about preparedness. And we don't spend enough time on preparedness. And it's very hard to pay for the type of systems that we want in a time of COVID when we're not paying for those systems in 2017. You know what I mean? So like, so sometimes I do think we need to talk more about countries face these problems, not because they're willfully neglecting, but sometimes there are capacity problems. But knowing though that it is a capacity problem is really hard. Um, and knowing that that's the problem and actually everyone admitting to being that the problem needs a lot more focus. And that's why for me, after COVID or during COVID, during the first curve, we still need to understand in a lot better way comparatively, what are our, what are our blockages here? Is it that a politician doesn't want to report what's happening because they can't upscale quick enough and they can't get hold of the tests? Or is it because they just don't have enough people on the ground to do the testing because they've been doing austerity measures and they've not been actually paying enough public health people to be part of the system for the upscale? And they've got to train them and they've got to buy the equipment and they've got to do all these. So, you know, it's trying to understand sometimes what we're dealing with. And I know that the World Health Organization tends to not like to come out and make a call in these situations because they don't want to be seen as wrapping the knuckles of some and then allowing others maybe to get away with it. And this is particularly, I think we've got to talk about this in a funding context, right? Like, you know, there are some very wealthy states that have not done a good job in response to COVID. And the World Health Organization is not necessarily going to want to come out and admonish them too much 
because they've got to find diplomatic funding balance to juggle here, right? <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it, it, so and, and states that aren't doing a good job that aren't in positions of strong funding are not going to appreciate being told they're doing a bad job when there are some very wealthy states who are doing a bad job. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's trying to figure from whose perspective, I think it is a balance here, trying to figure out how do they provide the advice that needs to be provided and tell states you've got to do better, but do it in a way that doesn't look like they're taking advantage of power and money and all the influence. In terms of the media official, this is the crack, this is the one. Now, when I was doing this back in that period of time, Twitter, internet, Facebook was there, but it's on a whole other level now. And I think what we're seeing and what's the worry now is that at the time it was about the state needs to get ahead of the rumor curve. And I think that's still the case of the day. The state needs to get ahead of the rumor curve because the rumors, the infodemics can be harmful. But what we've seen is which what Fitchie was talking about before, it can also be an excuse to censor. It can also be an excuse to control the information. It can also be a rationale to limit the contestation and I think that was an area that hasn't been predicted or anticipated as well as what it could have been from a rights-based perspective. So I've been looking at the Oxford Law Group, the Oxford Latin Vickers Group on COVID and how they're looking at the, uh, the civil liberties response to COVID. And then I've also been following another group that have been looking at the civil liberties legislation. And for me, what's been really scary about that legislation is that actually, if you look at the human rights legislation pertaining to COVID, there's not been massive variations. And the reason is, is because Frighteningly to me, a lot of the containment of conversations and engagement and discussion on the uh, internet space is because under what they've done is they've just taken counter-terror legislation and they've just adapted it for COVID. So there's been a lot of emergency legislation that was introduced in the last decade or so around that area that's just been slightly adapted now to this because it falls under emergencies. And so I think we are in a new space now. And it's an area that I, I do worry a lot about. Coming back to my argument about if you're in a democratic state, I know which, you know, I think even some of our democratic states maybe uh, have the potential, that worrying tipping point in terms of what can be done, what can be challenged in the space. In a way though, that still needs to be right, directed and controlled within a public health measure, within a public health response. And I think, it's been interesting to see the way in which Twitter has responded compared to the way in which Facebook has responded. It's been interesting to see how Zoom is being managed and controlled in some states versus others. Um, you know, I don't have an answer on that question. It's an excellent question. And I think it's one that requires a lot more engagement, a lot more attention. And it's one that I particularly would say that it's an area that I, um, I haven't done as much study on, but I'd like to, because I think you're right, it's, it's going to be vital. It's been vital in COVID and it's attached to contact tracing, which is another area as well that's going to be really important. Uh, sorry, uh, there's a sound of a kettle here. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a get great answer. I think the media somehow, I think it's, it's you know, it's a double-edged sword, right? Government need to, con to somehow hold the media or ask the help from the media. For example, if we have, for example, in Indonesia, a very famous drummer that said that COVID is just a myth, uh, you know, conspiracy theory, and then he got, he's really popular, and then and people like believe him more, go out without masks, and so on, and it became, became problematic. But then there are also government that actually use buzzer, internet buzzer, to to censor and control the 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 news about the government uh, when the government uh, being said not being able to um, uh, handle the the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, right, I'm gonna pick up your comment about uh, how the health. Um, um, the health uh, department or um, institution or those people that is in charge in health oftentimes are not being given priority or not being listened to and that give effect to uh, you know um, that manage or mismanage the, the crisis in the beginning and and um, and then your your 
I, I wanted to know that what, what's your take? Uh, because there, we have this uh, two great uh, question first is by um, Andrew Igunamantong uh, that commented about how great is your presentation and asked about um, the unfinished business in regard to state capacity. Uh, and, and do you think it's putting a general over there as heading this uh, health crisis, right? right? Um, military general, police general, that doing the securitization um, is related to state capacity uh, to create a sense of emergency. Um, is the securitizing pattern similar across ASEAN countries or is it varied across cases, especially uh, the reference object, securitizing actors and the nature of domestic audience? Does it make any difference today since probably states cannot agree on what is the most endangered and what were prompted by how, and they were prompted by how much economic can be disrupted and border flows can be so disrupted at the earlier stage of the, especially at the early stage of COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Um, and um, and a similar question is raised by Astri Rafika. Well, we, we like if we have women asking questions, right? Uh, because, you know, just give voices like, uh, uh, oh, she also asked um, the securitization process in, in ASEAN member countries. Do you see, do you see, do you see it? What are, how, how, how is it differ or whether it's the same? Because you were mentioning also how countries are scrambling about just copying or like adopting their counterterrorism legislation into a, a COVID, um, um, you know, uh, disaster uh, management law, which is strange. Yeah, uh, yeah. Time is yours, as and maybe because of this is um, time is not on our side. Sometimes, always. Uh, yeah, uh, this would be probably my last series of bullet question that I raised to you. Thank you. Thank you. So, securitization is a really difficult but interesting point to raise because you've got, as was well articulated in that quote, that first question, who is your referent object here? And, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and it should be stated at the outset that there's been a big debate, some of you may or may not be aware of around securitization and its origins and its use and at the moment. Um, I think that there is validity in exploring it in the ASEAN context because it is one that people like Malika Brera Anthony has identified as being such an important normative influence in the region. Um, and it was a particularly important influence at the time that we're going back and looking about when health security was first being used in the region back in the 2000s, because it was around a way in which it was trying to articulate particularly this idea of non-traditional security. And, and human security was a way in which of trying to identify that the state has responsibilities to its population. And that the state is not just secure because it is able to prevent uh, war or, or end conflict. It is also secure when it's able to ameliorate health insecurity, environment insecurity, food insecurity, um, you know, economic insecurity. And so while the effort was still to try and protect the state and to rarefy and make the state the object that is supported and strengthened, the attempt there was to try and broaden your concept of what makes a secure state, what makes a prosperous state, what makes a state that is one that everyone wants to live in peacefully. Uh, and the idea was that cooperation in the region should be around those endeavours. And that was part of the idea that others have argued was around the three pillars and around that idea of the ASEAN community, that states at the time anyway, was that, you know, the reason why you had the charter constructed the way it was, was because it was a normative endeavour. There was acknowledgement at the time that you weren't going to get the same type of international law and charter that you could create, say, in the EU context, but you could create something that was aspirational within the parameters of what consensus building permits and sovereign non-interference permits within ASEAN. The argument that's emerged since then is that, and I, and I do believe, I'm one of those who do believe that if we look in the early context of health security, that was very much the language in the use. So you talk about, there's a lot of talk about universal healthcare coverage and a focus on endemic diseases because there was this sense that it has to be, health security has to deliver a 
has to deliver security for populations in all health po healthy populations. And it was actually interesting to me that when I would follow through with the conversations and the language at the time, there was a lot of conversations around, well, this is, this is, it's not going to work in our communities. It's not gonna work if we just say we're building a H5N1 clinic or we're building PCR testing. We need to have the capacity to show that we can also do TB testing and that we can also be here as a clinic that can meet for women and children, you know, who may be, you know, for vaccinations and for pregnancy. So there was a lot of discussions and sometimes pushback on that focus on health security just means emerging infectious diseases. And so for me, what was at the time was that interesting then conversations around the donor system and, and how you could create investments in emerging infectious diseases. So the idea at the time of the IHR was that it was a capacity building that would support health system strengthening. What I would argue has happened more, particularly under these JEE arrangements, the Joint External Evaluation Arrangements, I think, is less emphasis on that. I think we've gone very much down the path of, this is about building states that can respond to outbreak events. And this is about funding states that can respond to outbreak events. Now, this is quite controversial what I'm saying, but I do sincerely believe it. And I think that's playing into the hands of a lot of states in the region that also think that's what it's about. And you've got a situation at the moment where not every state, where we've got democratization going through different levels and different areas of pushback, as Vitri was talking about, you know, and I think that it's a worrying time because when, and I, I worry about what COVID is going to create uh, in terms of the discussion around health security and how we're going to collectively understand after this, what is the best system to have in response? Because I would say that at every state, lots of states, their first instinct in this environment has been to protect their own national health system capacity. Lots of states, not just, and even the states that have done very well, okay? A lot of the states that have done well have done the same, you know, they've locked down trade and travel, they've done lockdowns, you know, so I think we're going through a shift at the moment would be my argument. I wouldn't be yet at this point, I would say that health security, as I understood it and thought about it, is going to go through a change. And, and I don't know if we're all going to emerge out of this with a similar idea of what it is. I think the funding direction was already taking us there. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see in the next couple of years how that goes. Thank you, Sarah. I, there's still a lot of question and it's really interesting to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. I really wish we could like discuss more, but you know, time is not in our side. Uh, but I guess, um, so the, that long question and very excellent question was from um, Andrew, Andrew Mantong, um, my colleague at CSIS. Uh, he's a researcher and also lecturer at University of Indonesia. That's why he raised um, um, uh, issue about securitization and 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 that what he raised uh, additionally is um, the question is how should we I think it's a, a mutual concern I mean I don't I think Australia has been very successful yeah maybe you can teach to like your lesson learned to other country but unfortunately not all the country have the same one attitude leadership democracy is up yeah, political system um, um, also investment in the health sector, right? And, and uh, so the question that perhaps uh, countries in the world aside of Australia <laughs> have to deal is like, how we improve not only um, uh, the bigger question of the health region, uh, right? How, how we give health to people and, and also be, um, uh, and also, I mean, and also be transparent and then reporting the right, uh, what is right, what is transparent across the world. And, and, and um, that's, that's, you know, it's, I guess it's a challenge. And I don't know whether, whether the government can do that or, or the religions, because I have another lecture, uh, researcher, um, Muhammad Habib, that, that is specialized in how in Indonesia, you know, and maybe other countries in the world, perhaps Singapore as well, and, and in, um, in churches and in, um, yeah, you see in, I think in, uh, in Taiwan, uh, um, and South Korea, that, that, that like the COVID spread in then religious um, uh, settings. And, and it's, it's really difficult 
because help the government cannot give help for all but religion can give like at least a little bit of consolation for all you know and maybe maybe we can engage the religious actors as a counterbalance of the media but who knows who knows i don't know um, now i give you the chance to give like a uh, closing remarks and in terms of what do you want to see a way forward and how we can actually build international cooperation at the time that countries i mean peoples around the world are actually questioning uh, their government in, in terms of whether they give actual reporting and actually giving um like you know human right uh, um, angle to to the people and not the security securitization to to the people and to want to secure their reputation. Here. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you everyone for your questions and thank you for listening. And I didn't show this at the end, but you'll have my slides, I think, available if you want to look at them. And I'm happy to take emails and contact me on Twitter if you'd like to find me there. Sarah E. Davies, Sarah E. In terms of my closing remarks, um, in terms of where we go next, yeah. I think I've talked a lot about the areas where I've seen concern uh, in the questions. Um, the things that I'd like to point out that I think are important moments of opportunity is that we've had actors engaging in COVID that haven't necessarily in the past with other types of pandemics. I particularly would like to acknowledge what Fitch was saying before, which is, you know, you've had the mobilization of civil society organizations in response to COVID and particularly in locations where states have been uh, falling short of their obligations to their population. And it's been really important actually to identify how civil society organizations are operating in these spaces. Can we do more to think about their safe operation? Uh, we need to know these stories and we need to communicate these stories. So we need to do, there's a lot of research I would argue that needs to be done in this space to contact uh, how different environments, youth groups, women's groups, um, ethnic minority groups, refugee groups, as well as religious groups and indigenous groups have activated and mobilized in response to this outbreak when their governments have failed to do so. And also to understand the good cases when the government has supported them. Because what we want to do as well is while civil society organizations are important and vital and we need to know more about their work in this space, we also need to make sure that they are safe to work in this space and we need to know what resistance they encountered. And we also need to then think about how to embed the work that they're doing within a, within a budget and within a structure that supports them because that's really important as well, right? We, cannot keep relying upon populations to do this work for free it's exploitation and it's not secure you know and i think that's also what we've seen with the COVID response there is a lot of health care and there's a lot of community information that is provided through informal unpaid spaces and that is a problem because it's not always uh, safe and reliable in situations when states decide that they want to then wrest control back again of the internet or other areas. I think the other thing that's been really important about this outbreak though has been, and it is important to note this, has been the speed with which we've all responded. You hear people, you see people roll their eyes and go, oh, and you know, when I say to people, well, it could have been much worse. I actually am one of those who for all of the criticism that I've had <laughs> in this conversation, I do honestly believe that the response in this region and in other, really, um, I do honestly believe knowing what I knew about capacity and awareness and sense of obligation in the 2000s compared to today, I actually do think the response could have been worse. And I really do believe that I've got no way to prove it, but I really do believe that there is a sense of awareness. There is a sense of, of obligation that was not there, um, you know, and it was very different understandings of how it worked. I do believe that the World Health Organization has tried to create with states have tried to create this shared understanding, a shared obligation to report. And I, but I do think we've got a lot more work to do and COVID has exposed how much more work we have to do in this space. Um, and I think also what's been important about this outbreak has been the focus and attention on groups at risk. 
So I think that's the other thing that's been really beneficial about COVID. If there's anything that's beneficial out of COVID, which is not much, but the one thing that we have had to have conversations about is how this disease works is exploitation of minority, marginalized, discriminated groups. And we've had to confront that in a way that we've been allowed to kind of neglect in some circles. And some states still are neglecting it, right? And that's why the outbreak is still going so bad. But the evidence will come through as it is at the moment in certain countries where if you've got ethnic minority groups without access to healthcare, if you've got undocumented migrant groups, if you've got large numbers of unpaid or voluntary healthcare workers operating with no PPE, mostly women, you've got large numbers of people living in, cluster, in, in, in condensed urban environments, you've got the perfect recipe for cluster contamination. And that is a direct link then between our intersectionalities, between our race discrimination, gender discrimination, economic discrimination, and your vulnerability to this disease. Um, and so we need to have conversations about that. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Sarah Davis. Um, it's, it's been wonderful having you, ladies and gentlemen. That uh, that is Professor Sarah Davis, professor at School of Government and International Relations Group at University of Australia, and her book, Containing Contagious: um, The Politic of Disease Outbreak in Southeast Asia, can be found in um, bookstores that sells English um, language book and also soft copy uh, perhaps uh, in Amazon and Kindle. Thank you very much for joining us at the CSIS lecture series on regional dynamics. I hope uh, we will see you again in our next uh, lecture. Thank you, Professor Sarah Davis. Thank you. Thank you.